Morning, Linda Dunn. Good morning, Marion. Morning, Marion. Good morning, everybody who's here. We're being we're all muted, Linda. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll I'll mute it.
Welcome. Welcome both St. Matthews and Bloor Street and of course Trinity St. Paul's to this summer worship. And also welcome no matter what you believe, welcome what you do not, despite what you don't believe, welcome no matter what you have done and welcome no matter what you have left undone, welcome no matter who you are and of course, welcome no matter who you love because this is not just the domain of any of our individual churches, nor is it only the domain of the United Church of Canada. This is in fact a church of Christ. And in Christ church, everyone, everyone is welcome. We're about to light our Christ candle. Listen to these words. God in our being, your Christ is called the radiant dawn of justice. May this dawn rise in our hearts and in the world. May the light which is life and love overflow in our presence as surely as the sun rises each day, for this is the light of Christ, the light of our world. And now we're going to have a bit of fun. We are going to practice something that Christians have been doing for 2,000 years plus. And that is we're going to show each other, first of all, that we love each other. And second of all, that we don't walk the spiritual path alone. We do this. It's called passing of the peace. Uh, any way we want. If you're going to kiss somebody or hug somebody, please get their okay first. Um, other than that, I started all off by saying, the peace of Christ be with you. Go for it. That's on Zoom. Peace of Christ, everybody. Peace of Christ. 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 Good morning, everyone. Tina, Lori. Lori, Tina. East of Christ, Lord. everyone. East Dale. Donna. East Dorothy. Peace, Peace Andy, Mary. Tina, Bridget, Bridget. Sheila. Kind of always want that to go on for at least another half an hour, right? You know. uh, life and work of the congregation have, we're trying to save on paper this summer. So the sheets that you have are generic, obviously, and we're using them all summer long. So please, in that spirit, return them when you leave the sanctuary. Also, we're using hymn books. And I know especially for Trinity St. Paul's. We're not used to that necessarily. So you will need your hymn books, both the big red one and the smaller one, Voices United and more Voices United. So just to let you know that. And as always, we acknowledge, oh, James, yes, come and do something. Hi, good morning. My name is James and I'm from Trinity St. Paul's. Um, for those of you who are from other uh, congregations may not know me, but um, those who are from Trinity St. Paul's do. And they all know, and I'm using this opportunity to make a commercial for the rest of you. Um, my husband and I send um, big boxes of clothing and food and backpacks and children's things to the Philippines three or four times a month. Um, so if any of you have old clothes or school supplies or backpacks or sheets, towels, pillowcases, you know, all that kind of stuff, just let me know. Um, and um, we'll come and pick it up and we'll ship it away for you to the Philippines. Okay, thanks everybody. And you can let them know after the service, we're gonna be having coffee and munchies in the garden. So don't leave, come out to the garden at the back. It'll be beautiful. We're gonna acknowledge that we are on traditional territory and Betty's gonna help us do that. Um, 
this is going to be a little longer today. Um, in our May meeting of WAF, which is the Worship and Faith Formation Committee at Trinity St. Paul's, we discussed the land acknowledgement. We talked about Cliff Cardinal's play, Land Acknowledgement, originally done at Crow's Theatre and more recently at Mervish. It is a scathing, powerful, humorous piece of theatre examining the relationship between Indigenous peoples and settlers in relationship to the theft of the land. Once you have seen it, you will never hear a land acknowledgement again and not remember this play. We had a presentation at WAF by Lynn Jondreville on how to do the land acknowledgement. He referred us to Raven Trust, which has a guide on their website, and he said that Roger Townsend in our congregation, because of his background with First Nations issues through his work, had written the words we use at TSP. One of the guidelines from Raven was to try to personalize the acknowledgement from your own experience. So I am going to tell you a story from my experience. In 1986, I had been seconded to start the adult literacy program in the Ontario government, and had set it up in three streams, English, Francophone, and Native recognizing that each one would serve a different cultural and or linguistic group and would need to reflect that. We hired Priscilla George to lead the native stream. Later at a naming ceremony that I was honored to attend, she was given the name Ningwakwe, which is what she called herself after that. I must say here that Ningwakwe has given me her permission to use her story. The Native Literacy Coordinator set about working with First Nations and Indigenous groups in cities across Ontario, Ontario to set up programs to provide adults in their communities with literacy and basic skills education. And it may have been a first two that we were, she was working on First Nations, even though we weren't the federal government, um, as well as in cities and towns. Before long, over 30 programs had begun and were funded by Ontario, and I believe most have thrived since. Later, a publishing organization, which called itself Ningwakwe after her, was established to provide learning materials reflecting the Indigenous culture and experience. In 1989, I took my holiday in September, as usual, to attend the Toronto International Film Festival. I saw a film where the spirit lives. It was about a residential school in the 1930s, billed as the first film ever on this topic. It starred as an Indigenous girl, then child actor Michelle St. John, and Anne-Marie MacDonald as the teacher with whom she developed a close relationship. I phoned Priscilla, that's what I called her then, to tell her about the film and suggest she might want to see it. I knew Priscilla had been stolen, at five years old, along with four older brothers from her Ojibwe parents on Saugeen First Nation, near Owen Sound. They had been sent to the Mohawk Institute near Six Nations in Brantford, home to cultural and linguistic groups different than Ningwakwe's Ojibwe people. So at five, she was in this so-called school, which she called the mush hole, because they served only gruel, forbidden to speak with her own brothers, as, as were they forbidden to speak with each other and with her. Ningua Kwa went to the second showing of the film at TIFF. I have never forgotten what she told me about it. That film has nothing to do with anything we experienced. Never could there have been any positive relationship between a staff person and a student. That would have been impossible. I and every other student lived each day, each night, each moment of our lives in fear. Fear also haunted our dreams. I have never forgotten her searing description of her time in that institution and later in the Indian Day School on Salgeen where they were treated much the same. She told me recently that the other thing that has always stayed with her besides the memory of fear was the inmate children sticking together to support each other as best they could. She said that lesson, the need to support each other, has stayed with her forever. 
As an adult, Ningua Kwe spent many years in healing through practicing her indigenous spiritual traditions. She emerged as a leader in indigenous education and was asked to help establish programs in other provinces and territories, as well as speak at conferences across Canada and in far-flung parts of the globe, such as New Zealand and Brazil. She also told me that she was not impressed with how many, how many people approach reconciliation. Um, not all, but many people. For example, as she called it, by wearing Indian swag and mouthing slogans. To truly recognize Indigenous culture, she felt we all have to embrace the idea that all lives are sacred those are her words, and demonstrate that each day by our words and actions to each other and every human being we encounter. Soon after I came to TSP for the first time, we had Paying Rent Sunday when all donations went to two groups in Toronto, Name Res and the Native Women's Resource Centre of Toronto. I was thrilled because those were two of the first Native literacy programs set up in our city. I have also cherished the ways in which the Indigenous Justice Group and others have worked with Indigenous people to honour them and their culture, including their involvement in climate justice events such as in concert with creation. So now I will say the land acknowledgement, which ends with our collective commitment to right the wrongs of the past and present. As we assemble in this holy place, we recognize that for thousands of years, this territory has been a sacred gathering place for many peoples of Turtle Island. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of several indigenous nations and wish to pay special recognition to the Mississaugas of the credit. The original nations continue to cry out for justice. And together, as treaty people, we commit to listen, learn and work to right the wrongs of the past and present. Thank you for that, Betty. Let's enter into prayer. Let's take a deep breath and be here now and listen to these words which constitute our call to worship. Seeking your sanctuary and your space of love and safety, divine one, May we settle now in our hearts and minds, open to the reality of your love and your power. May we hear your word and speak your truth and always act as you ask and teach. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Our opening hymn is that big red book, Voices United. It's number 578, David is going to play it once through, and the title of this hymn is As a Fire is Meant for Burning.
Our first reading this morning is James 1, 12 to 26. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. He himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then, when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves, and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Luke 11, 30, uh, 33 to 36. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar, but on a lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your, your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if it is not healthy, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, consider whether the light in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, with no part of it in darkness, it will be as full of light as when a lamp gives you the light with its rays. Thanks be to God. Some of you have been here the last few Sundays, and you know that for July, we are focusing on our elders, and we are focusing on lives lived in faith, and the stories of those who live their lives in faith. And I'm particularly awed, I'm awed, to be in the presence of a woman who has done just that, uh, Nenki Jungkind. I hope I pronounced that correctly, did I? Okay more or less. Um, and a bit of a trigger warning, because when I read Nenki's story, and I'm going to share her bio with you, um, the first thought that came to my mind was, this is an incredibly brave woman for telling her truth. There's a, there's a quote that I've used often, which is, if one woman told the truth, the world would break apart. And so today you will hear the truth of this one woman. Some of Nenki's story. I was my mother's first and smallest baby of six. I was conceived just before the hunger winter of 1944 to 1945 in the Netherlands. I'm sure that because she was pregnant, mum received what food there was, but there wasn't much of it. I do know that she was heavily pregnant with me 
and danced joyously in the streets on the 5th of May, 1945. Her mother-in-law informed her that was unseemly for her in her condition. And she for once defied her and said, mother, we're free, and kept on dancing. I was born on June 16th. All my life, I have felt hungry and thought about food constantly. I was raped by one of my father's younger workmen when I was five or six and shamed and blamed myself for it for decades. Where do children get that from at that young an age? I shot myself in the foot in as many ways as I could without any awareness that that's what I was doing. Emigration from the Netherlands to Canada at age eight. I was placed in grade one, although I could write with ink, do fractions and decimals, but could not speak or understand English. Eight-year-olds would not socialize with me because I was in grade one and could not yet speak English. Canada was not yet as diverse as it has now become. Although always at the top of my class, Somehow it had been decided that skipping had not worked well, and I was not ever allowed to be with my age group. That has marked me. I never had peers throughout my school years. Grade 13 did me in with our only allowable mark being the exam results, and not any of the work anyone had done throughout the year, and I missed passing trigonometry by three marks. I did not have a sense of belonging until I joined Cakes for the Queen of Heaven at Bloor Street United in 1989. It has taken me decades of good work with a good psychiatrist to get over myself and these early traumatic experiences. I met John Gladwell while I was in Alberta. We married on the 19th of February, 1967, and separated 23rd of March, 1969. He was paranoid, diagnosed as schizophrenic, and probably homosexual. He was raised Plymouth Brethren, and we were shunned as he had gone to see a movie at a cinema. He died in 2000, by then a street person, evangelizing others in Tabor, Alberta. I met Robert Toon on the 1st of November, 2003. Although I had spoken to him a few times on the telephone, as a fellow volunteer in Barbara Hall's second Merrill race. I had resolved some years before that I was not interested in ever marrying again. He convinced me, and we married the 7th of May, 2005. Rob had several strokes in September 2009, liposarcoma in 2019, COVID in 2021. So me becoming a caregiver has been an evolving role. I too had something. I had breast cancer in December 2015 and completed radiation in April 2018. The body is not what it used to be. And despite long COVID, I too am getting better. In my work life, I have always been an administrator, coordinator, and educator. I was a Gal Friday, office helper, office manager, office administrator, association manager, church administrator at Timothy Eaton Memorial, St. Luke's and Coburn United Churches, St. Clement's Eglinton Anglican, and congregational consultant for stewardship services at General Council of the United Church of Canada traveling to congregations across Canada and staying with them for four to six week stints for 14 years, ending in June 1994, with denominational budget cuts and I freelanced in congregations for some years after that. My life is a life of ministry. My life in the church has always been active, from teaching Sunday school to leading youth groups, chairing committees, including the worship committee in the CRC. At Bloor Street, I have served on and chaired many committees, including church council, pastoral relations, presbytery representative, on discernment committees and commissions, and the candidacy board for Shining Waters. 
Spiritually, I have journeyed from being a very strict, rule-bound, dogmatic, and doctrinal Calvinistic Christian to a simple follower of Jesus. In 1969, I could feel God close to me as a separated woman. If God had not abandoned me in these six months, yes, it took me that long because of the choices I had made, perhaps there's another interpretation and understanding of biblical text. Perhaps that's possible, and I could remain a child of God. Robert tells me that since World War II, not much has changed. He was in a Japanese concentration camp run by the Japanese in Indonesia with his mother and younger sister. His father was a prisoner of war on the Burma Siam Railroad. Canadians of Japanese origin were interred in camps in Canada, as were other people of other ethnicities who were considered suspect. We have assisted so many refugees over the years. Owens, who was helped by Doris Lessing, and Diana Wiwa, who was helped by Flora MacDonald, who had to escape from Nigeria. Their cousin, Bariadura, who spent 10 years in a camp in Ghana before he was sponsored and admitted to Canada. Bismarck and Sander Apoku Bonzu, who had to leave Ghana. Osman and Sema, who fled Turkey the Fatou family who fled Syria, Fuad and Hadiya who fled Yemen. And today there is war in so many places, including Burkino, Burkina Faso, the Sudan, and in Ukraine. So many people have been killed and so many try to escape to peaceful countries, including Canada. Since 1956, I've been involved with varying waves of immigrants, migrants, and refugees. I remember so well coming to Canada as an eight-year-old little girl with long braids who had a strange name and didn't know any English and who quickly became the interpreter of language and culture for my family. Canada has not yet become very good at welcoming folks from other traditions and experiences, although there have been some improvements. There needs to be more to reduce the barriers of experienced professionals who have their learnings and experiences and need to have them validated so that they can more easily and less expensively become successful professionals here. Thank you, Nenki. Nenki, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so many questions from that, <laughs> but let's start with the scripture because it's quite a story. Why did you choose this scripture? Well, it took me a long time to choose this scripture. I read all of the Gospels and many of the epistles. Not much of Paul, I have to admit. But I did read all the others. And then I realized that really any one passage couldn't interpret my understanding of God and faith. And I was perplexed because I could have taken the passage that Bob Hilliard took two weeks ago, which I thought was marvelous, but that had already been used. So I found these passages because they talked about light and that we imbue God's light. And also that they talked about doing our faith, not simply talking about our faith. And to me, that's elemental. Being our authentic selves. Rob was sitting on a bench in our neighborhood not too long ago, and someone approached him and said, do you believe in God and Jesus Christ? And sat down beside him, and Rob said yes. And then turned to him and said, and what are you doing about it? <laughs> and proceeded to inform this man of Jeremiah's Field, which is a interest-free loan program that we have at Bloor Street United Church, where refugees can come and ask for a loan for their permanent residency card or their citizenship or things of that nature. In fact, Bismarck and Sandra are here today because they 
needed money, he had visas for them that would be uh, invalid in about 10 or 14 days. And could we lend him the money so that his family could come here? And we did. We got him the money in time and they could use their visas in time. And he has paid it back, which is what this loan requires or relies on so that it's a revolving fund. And so that conversation of Rob with this man, I thought was somewhat key to the way I attempt to live my life. I'm not sure that I'm quite as brave as he is in saying to people, and what are you doing about it? Uh, but I do try to model that just by being who I have become. So uh, we started off with a terrible story from your very early childhood. It's not an unusual story for women. We know that one in four women is assaulted, uh, probably more than that. Those are the ones who will admit to it. Um, but that's a brave thing to say. Um, and that is certainly trauma. And you have worked, as you say. Um, any advice for other women, other girls, um, both cis and trans and other who have also been assaulted. What, what gave you hope? What got you through? Thank you. It's a hard journey. Um, you have to acknowledge what has happened and who you are in that moment. And it took me a long time. I remember I was about 18 when I heard that statistic that you just mentioned of 25% of women have been sexually assaulted. And I remember walking out of there saying, I'm nothing but a bloody statistic. And somebody said, what do you mean? And I didn't tell them at that time, but later on informed them my story, which I had not forgotten, but it wasn't preying on my mind with an EY, not an AY. Uh, on a constant basis, and yet that was when I started to work through that part of my story. And it's very, very hard to come to recognize, and if it wasn't for this wonderful psychiatrist that I happened to find because someone else acknowledged that I was probably dealing with seasonally affective disorder, and should probably have a psychiatrist. And I found this person by fluke, not plan. And we had a 35 year relationship until she retired last year. And initially she helped hold up the mirror for me so that I could begin to recognize some of what I had done over the years. It took a long time, it was painful, and it was very important work. So looking at your own traumas, whatever they may be, and recognizing them and learning to deal with them is very important work because it frees you up to be who you can be, and to no longer be imprisoned by what you have done to yourself as a result of that trauma. I blamed myself, I invalidated myself, I took the road of least resistance all the time. I remember my mother accusing me of that. She didn't know what had happened to me, although I had tried to tell her but I didn't have the words or the vocabulary to be specific. She does remember wagging her finger in his face and saying, don't hurt my little girl, or I'll tell your boss and you won't have a job. This was in a small village in the Netherlands and there weren't many jobs available and my parents happened to be able to give people work. So your story, whatever it may be, is valuable and can inform you the right way and not only the wrong way. 
So don't hide it. Find a trusting person or professional and deal with it. Thank you. What can we do better? You described your early childhood experience in a Canadian school. Oh. With, I mean, you, had, you actually had better skills than all the students in your class, but because you didn't speak English, you, you were ostracized. What can we do better to welcome children whose parents have immigrated and who may not have English in our educational system? Well, some of you may know a couple of weeks ago, we welcomed our most recent Syrian refugees uh, amongst us uh, when we met at St. Matthew's. And we had lunch after the service with them. And I sat beside the eight-year-old Islam, who I asked her, of course, and what grade are you in? And she's in grade three. Imagine. And she goes to ESL, which of course didn't exist in 1953. So I think to give people a peer group and to assume that they belong there and to help them with ESL in addition to their regular schoolwork lets them catch up. I know that school systems around the world are not alike. Some children don't have the opportunity to go to school at all. Some are homeschooled. Some are bright and intelligent and have found all kinds of ways to become educated without regular school classes. But to be amongst peers would have been heaven for me, I think, because I don't know. And I think if we can accept people for who they are and who they say they are, and then find a way of evaluating that in situ and offering assists as required would be wonderful. And I know that for in the medical fields that that's difficult and risky, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. So let's talk about church. You oh, have... Church. <laughs> You have been across the country. You've seen lots of congregations. You've uh, done one of the hardest job, maybe, that, that there that exists in a church, and that's stewardship, i.e. it incorporates raising of funds, other things too. You were that person to help congregations do. So a couple of learnings, Nenki, that you can pass on to the rest of us. Like, what should we be doing? Well, stewardship isn't that hard. It's everything that you do after you say, I believe regardless of what follows that statement. It simply is all of what you do with all of your resources. And so we are expressing our faith at all times. You know, so it's not just about money? It's not just for money. It's with energy, it's with skills, it's with gifts, it's with, you know, we used to call them talents and treasures. I call them skills, abilities, energy, time, money. It just is. And if we deal with it in that ordinary a fashion and don't call them talents and treasures as though only a few of us have those, people like Randy, you know, who can sing and perform and administer and manage and, and do all kinds of other wonderful things. And there are many others of us who also have talents and treasures. And some of us indeed have treasures and wealth, and some of us don't. And that doesn't excuse anybody. It simply means that we do what we can with what we have. And so I was brought up that way. I thought that was normal. When I told my father I was fairly recently separated. I was not making very much money. And I didn't have a telephone. And I used the telephone at work between, on my lunch hour. And then I got a telephone. And then I could tie the game. And I told my dad, well, I can finally tie the game and I have a telephone. 
And he turned to me and he said, and what have you been doing all this time? My father thought tithing was normal. When he brought home his pay envelope, which it used to be cash in a little brown envelope that he would bring home weekly when he worked for someone else, 10% would automatically go for the church. And then, you know, if I said my toes hurt because the shoes were too small, he'd say, not this week, dear. And in a subsequent week, I'd get a new pair of shoes. And we would buy the groceries we needed and the milk my brothers drank and all of that. And so it was a way that I was brought up. And to me, I didn't know it wasn't normal. So when I came to stewardship services and worked across the church, it was a wonderful eye-opener to recognize the vastness of our country, the vastness of life experiences, faith experiences, and how congregations gel or not around a vision. Because that old verse in Proverbs that says, without a vision, the people perish. And so each of us has to have a vision, and collectively as a congregation, we need to have a vision. And then we can thrive. It doesn't need to be all over the map. It doesn't need to be in the newspapers or on the television. Thriving is just being our best selves. And there are so many ways of doing that and being that. So what's your vision, Nenki? What's my vision? Oh. I wish we could find peace. I wish we could live in love and be a whole lot less judgmental than we have become. I wish we could find ways of offering dignity to each other, regardless of perspectives, because they will vary. And as someone said on Facebook this week, God didn't say convert your neighbor, God said love your neighbor. And if we can simply accept each other as we have become, and work together for those things that are good, and do away with homelessness, I think in this city, if we could resolve, fix, eliminate, reduce homelessness, we collectively will thrive because everything else will be possible too. I'm delighted that we have a new mayor. I'm delighted that we have a new vision. We have yet to give her the scope to make her mark but let's see what we can do to help. That's a beautiful place to end it, just for now. Um, but certainly engage with Nenki afterwards uh, over coffee and tea in the garden and um, show her some love. What an incredible life. Thank you for sharing it with us, Nenki. Uh, she gave me the, the perfect introduction to asking for the offering, talking about tithing. What is tithing? It's a percentage of your income that you dedicate to the work of, well, 10%. You heard it from her. I didn't say that. There you go. <laughs> Let's just say a percentage of your income that you dedicate to the work of, of God in this world. And so when you do that, you can do it a number of ways because we have a number of congregations represented here. So if you're from St. Matt's, um, if you look on the back, you can send an e-transfer to that address. Or if you come from Bloor Street, you can scan that QR code with your phone 
And if you come from Trinity St. Paul's, you can do the same. Scan the QR code with your phone and give generously. Give generously so that we can keep the Nenkis of the world um, employed in this incredible conglomerate of Nenkis called the United Church of Canada. And we're gonna sing. We're gonna sing More Voices 10. That's the little book. And again, David is going to play some of that for us. Um, because we come from different places, the way we do it here at Trinity St. Paul's is we sit for the first verses and we stand for the final verse as the offering is brought forward. So that's more voices 10, come and seek the ways of wisdom. One, Holy One, Creator, source of all love. We know that everything we have comes from you. We are never ever really grateful enough. I bring before you that image that we just heard, that little girl with long pigtails who came into a foreign country and didn't know what people were saying and did her best. And her best was so very good. Her best was the best. Might we give our best to you. That truly is the greatest of our gifts back to you and to all creation. And as we do this, know that your gaze is upon us, you smile upon us, you created us in your image and you love us. We know this because you sent one to be one among us and that one in whose name we pray is Jesus Christ, amen. Please be seated.
The prayers will include two periods for silent prayer introduced by the words, Holy God, speak with us now in the silence of our hearts, and ending with the words, Loving God, hear our prayers, and in your love, answer. Let us pray. Loving Creator and Holy Spirit, we thank you for each one of our three congregational communities and the hope and support members offer to each other as we face the demands of our private lives and the increasing challenges we have as people of this city, our country, and our small shared planet. Thank you also for the wonderful young people, many of them studying or about to study at Emmanuel College that have enriched our congregation at TSP recently and who make so many contributions. May we learn how to live in peace with each other as you taught us to do and to find means of addressing our problems without war, without aggression, and without exclusion of anyone through poverty, racism, nationalism, and judgment of those different from ourselves. Please forgive our past sins with regard to the harm we have done to your amazing creation. Help us find innovative solutions collectively and individually to ameliorate the damage already done by us in this Anthropocene epic. This era has been dominated by indelible human-made impacts to the beautiful earth you endowed us with. You chose our species to care for it on behalf of all of your creation, but we have failed you, each other, and all the other species you placed here. You have shown us recently through the wildfires and smoke we are living with, both a symptom of our past inaction to keep our environment safe and the cause of more catastrophic damage now and in the future if we do not act expeditiously to ameliorate our past failures. We, allow, we ask that you allow each of us to see clearly and know what to do to help each individual who, human person who is in front of us and needs our solace and help. We ask that you help us to face up to how we can become more involved in the issues confronting our communities, our city, our country, and the world, and not turn away when there is something we can do to take action. May you show each of us how best to contribute to the improvement of life for individuals we meet and all those in our society. May you help us to recognize and learn how to fight racism, other hatred, exploitation and exclusion of any person or people by ourselves or by our governments, society and institutions. Help us and our leaders at each level to work collectively, openly, honestly and intelligently with each other to reach solutions that are humane, empathetic, equitable, sustainable and innovative for individuals and our society as a whole. Holy God, speak with us now in the silence of our hearts. Loving God, hear our prayers and in your love, answer. Now, Lord, we ask your divine intervention to help us to solve the entrenched problems in our world that we have created over decades. Help us to reach out as individuals and as a nation to many more of the 100 million displaced persons in our world, most of whom are in the poorest and middle-income countries. Help each refugee, asylum seeker, internally displaced person and stateless person deal with the paralyzing fear in their hearts of not knowing what the future holds. Help them find a safe haven and a roof over their heads in particular, we see what is happening to refugees in our city today, and we ask that they find shelter and that we may do what we each can for that to happen. Help us, rich nations, better share what we have. May Canada find ways to help those we are, now failing, we are failing now, including the Afghanis, the Ethiopians, the Sudanese, the South Sudanese, the Syrians, the Iraqis, the Yemeni, the Somalians, 
the people of South America, like the Venezuelans and others. May we overcome our current bureaucratic approach and multiple forms to act in a more timely way to save people we have left languishing in insecurity. May countries with entrenched issues regarding governance and human rights find peaceful solutions which serve all their people, including Israel and Palestine, Afghanistan, Libya, Tunisia, Sudan, Yemen, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Somalia, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Burkina Faso, and the Sahel, Central African Republic, Chad, and the Lake Chad Basin. And with the recent news in Kenya, we include Kenya and Uganda with their anti-LGBTQ laws. May we in Canada much work, work much harder to overcome the institutional races, racism, in particular against Blacks, Indigenous, and other people of color by our criminal justice system at every level, from legislatures enacting the laws, law enforcement, legal services, victim services, correctional services, various stakeholders, service providers, community members and groups, and other support systems such as health, education, and social services. Holy God, speak with us now in the silence of our hearts. Loving God, hear our prayers and in your love, answer. We pray for those we name now aloud or in silence. Um, Bloor Street United Church, list for healing and transformation. Roland Hartmans, Christine Lynn, Don Matheson, Janet Paquette, Carl Schuler, Marion Wall, and St. Matthews. Lori and her family who are grieving the passing of her mother, Shirley. David Cartner, Whitney's brother, er, Herb. Nellie Kimanguyi, Nellie's mom. Jane Cook. Maureen Carter, Whitney and family grieving the death of her mother, Margaret. Linda Goy Flint. Paduban McGeezy Quay, also known as Catherine Brooks. Cynthia Drakes, Dorothy Henry, Shireen, Sadie Dawson and Alex Hodges, Casilda, Cassandra, Rosie, Daphne, and Lilia, the Alalayan families, Karen Hilfman Milsom, also on the TSP list, Joseph Lataya Kiza, and the TSP requests, Barbara Monroe, Susan Fullerton, Rodolfo Estrada Alcorta, who has survived multiple physical and mental health issues and is today celebrating his 80th birthday. Farshad, Iris Horowitz, Kim Thorne, Penny Regal, Tony Wise, Batros and all the families in Sudan, Alana Hart O'Neill, Jackie McKinley undergoing treatment, Jr. M. Saeed, Jill Fluelling, J.R. Amani Tarud. Please name anyone else and those on Zoom and on mute if you wish to name anyone. Loving God, hear our prayers and in your love answer. We pray with the Shining Waters Regional Council of the United Church of which we are a part and for all the churches and congregations in Shining Water, Waters Region. The ecumenical prayer. We pray with the churches in Canada and throughout the world that their people may be faithful and their leaders wise. We pray now with the churches in Djibouti and Somalia. God, our creator, we bless you for the gift of life that you grant us. 
that strength of faith, so fragile and so powerful, which is nourished by the assurance of your love. We pray to you, O oh God, for the sustenance of life for the people of these countries. Stir up the strength and courage of all those who are engaged in working to end poverty and bring justice in these countries and around the world. Amen. Our closing hymn is, uh, again, in more voices, the smaller book, 209, Go Make a Difference. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Nenki for being so incredibly brave and for splitting the world open a little bit with her story and letting that light of hers and others shine in. I also want to thank Clara, our wonderful soloist, uh, and David for giving us some amazing music. David picks the music every week. I also want to thank um, those that we don't really acknowledge too much, not nearly enough, and that's James and Noah at the back who run everything, and also the Zoomers out there. And thank you, Zoomers, for worshiping with us. We know you're there, we love you, even if we can't see your faces. Have I left anybody out? James, for reading scripture at the drop of a hat, thank you. And of course, Betty, for prayers of the people and that long and lovely land acknowledgement, heartfelt, thank you so much. And to all of you for being here, because each one of you is created in the image of God, you may not know it, but you are all incredibly beautiful. You are absolutely perfect. There is absolutely no way to improve any of you. Uh, that's who you are. And we are so blessed by your presence. We don't have to like each other, but by God, we have to love each other. 
And just for an hour every Sunday, we do. So take that love and go out into this world that needs you so desperately. And know that when you do that, you never walk alone, but God, the source of all love, Jesus Christ, who is love incarnate, and the Holy Spirit, love's power, goes with you now and goes with you always. Amen.